All righty, read us on in. The Merchant of Venice, Act One, Scene One, Venice, a street. Enter Antonio, Salarino, and Celano. In sooth, I know not why I am so sad. It wearies me, you say it wearies you. But how I caught it, found it, or came by it, what stuff tis made of, whereof it is born, I am to learn. And such a want with sadness makes of me that I have much ado to know myself. Your mind is tossing on the ocean, there where your argosies with portly sail, like seniors and rich burghers, on the flood. Do overpeer the pretty traffickers that curtsy to them, do them reverence, as they fly by them with their woven wings. Believe me, sir, had I such ventured forth, the better part of my affections would be with my hopes abroad. I should be still plucking the grass to know where sits the wind, peering in maps and ports and piers and roads, and every object that might make me fear misfortune to my ventures out of doubt would make me sad. My wind cooling my broth would blow me to an ague when I thought what warm a wind too great a sea might do. I should not see the sandy hourglass run, but I should think of shallows and of flats and see my wealthy Andrew docked in sand, bailing her high top lower than her ribs to kiss her burial. Should I go to church and see thy holy edifice of stone and not bethink me straight of dangerous rocks, which touching but my gentle vessel's side would scatter all her spices to the stream and robe the roaring waters of my silks and in a word, but even now worth this and now worth nothing? Shall I have the thought to think on this and shall I lack the thought that such a thing be bechance would make me sad? But tell not me, I know, Antonio is sad to think upon this merchandise. Believe me, no. I thank my fortune for it. My ventures are not in one bottom trusted, nor to one place, nor is my whole estate upon the fortune of this present year. Therefore my merchandise makes me not sad. Why, then, are you in love? Fie, fie. Not in love, neither. Then let us say you are sad, because you are not merry, and twere as easy for you to laugh and leap and say you are merry, because you are not sad. Here comes Bassiano, your most noble kinsman, Gratuino and Lorenzo. Very well, we leave you now with better company. I would have stayed till I had made you merry, if worthier friends had not prevented me. Your worth is very dear in my regard. I take it your own business calls on you, and you embrace the occasion to depart. Good morrow, my good lords. Good signors both, oh. when shall we laugh? Say when! Say when! You grow exceeding strange. Must it be so? We'll make our leisures to attend on yours. My lord, Bassiano, since you have found Antonio, we too will leave you. But at dinner time, I pray you, have in mind where we must meet. I will not fail you. You look not well, Signor Antonio. You have too much respect upon the world. They lose it that do buy it with much care. Believe me, you are marvelously charged. I hold the world, but as the world, Gaudiano, a stage where every man must play a part and mine a sad one. Let me play the fool. With mirth and laughter, let old wrinkles come. And let my liver rather hot heat with wine than my heart cool with mortifying groans. Why should a man whose blood is warm within sit like his grandsire cut in alabaster? I tell thee what, Antonio, I love thee, and it is my love that speaks. 
There are a sort of men whose visages do cream and mantle like a standing pond, and do a willful stillness entertain with purpose to be dressed in an opinion of wisdom, gravity, profound conceit. As who should say, I am Sir Oracle, and when I ope my lips, let no dog bark. Oh, my Antonio, I do know of these that therefore only are reputed wise for saying nothing. I tell thee more of this another time. But fish not with this melancholy bait for this full gudgeon, this opinion. Come, good Lorenzo, fare ye well a while. I'll end my exhortation after dinner. Well, we will leave you then till dinner time. I must be one of these same dumb, wise men. Procrociano never lets me speak. Well, keep me company but two years more. Thou shalt not know the sound of thine own tongue. Farewell, I'll grow a talker for this gear. Thanks, a faith for silence is only commendable in a neat tongue's dried and a maid not mendable. Is that anything now? Gratiano speaks an infinite deal of nothing, more than any man in all Venice. His reasons are as two grains of wheat hid in two bushels of chaff. You shall seek all day ere you find them, and when you have them, they are not worth the search. Well, tell me now, what lady is the same to whom you swore a secret pilgrimage that you today promised to tell me of? It is not unknown to you, Antonio, how much I have disabled mine estate by something showing a more swelling port than my faints meet, than my faint means would, gra would grant continuance, nor do I now make moan to be abridged from such a noble rate, but my chief care is to come fairly off from the great depths where in my time something too prodigal hath left me gauged. To you, Antonio, I owe the most in money and in love, and from your love I have a warranty to unburden all of my plots and purposes, how to get clear of all the debts I owe. I pray you, good Bassanio, let me know it. And if it stands as you yourself still do, within the eye of honor, be assured, my purse, my person, my extremist means lie all unlocked to your occasions. In my school days, when I had lost one shaft, I shot his fellow off the self-same flight, the self-same way with more advised watch to find, to find the other forth. And by adventuring both, I oft found both. I urge this childhood proof, because what follows is pure innocence. I owe you much, and like a willful youth, that which I owe is lost. But if you please to shoot another arrow that self way which you did shoot the first, I do not doubt, as I will watch the aim. Or to find both, or bring your latter hazard back again, and thankfully rest debtor for the first. You know me well. And here and spend but time to wind about my love with circumstance. And out of doubt you do me now more wrong in making question of my uttermost than if you had made waste of all I have. Then do but say to me what I should do, that in your knowledge may by me be done, and I am pressed unto it. Therefore speak. In Belmont is a lady richly left, and she is fair and fairer than the word, of wondrous virtues. Sometimes from her eyes I did receive fair speechless messages. Her name is Portia. Nothing undervalued to Cato's daughters, Brutus's Portia. Nor is the wild world ignorant of her worth, for the four winds blowing from every coast. Renowned suitors and her sunny locks hang on her temples like a golden fleece. And many Jasons come in quest of her. Oh, my Antonio, had I but the means to hold a rival place with one of them. I have a mind pres presages me such thrift that I should questionless be fortunate. Thou knowest that all my fortunes are at sea. Neither have I money nor commodity to raise a present sum. Therefore go forth, try what my credit can in Venice do. That, that shall be racked even to the uttermost. 
to furnish thee to Belmont to fair Portia. Go presently inquire, and so will I, where money is, and I no question make, to have it of my trust or for my sake. Scene two. Belmont. A room in Portia's house. Enter Portia and Nerissa. By my troth, Nerissa, my little body is a weary of this great world. You would be, sweet madam, if your miseries were in the same abundance as your good fortunes are. And yet, for aught I see, they are as sick as that surfeit with which too much, as they that starve with nothing. Good sentences and well pronounced. They would be better if well followed. If to do were as easy as to know what were good to do, chapels had been churches and poor men's cottages, princes' palaces. It is a good divine that follows his own instructions. I can easier teach 20 what were good to be done than be one of the 20 to follow mine own teaching. The brain may devise laws for the blood, but a hot temper leaps or a cold decree. But this reasoning is not in the fashion to choose me a husband. Oh, oh me, the word choose. I may neither choose whom I would nor refuse whom I dislike. So is the will of a living daughter curbed by the will of a dead father. Is it not hard, Nerissa, that I cannot choose one nor refuse none? Your father was ever virtuous and holy men at their death have good inspirations, therefore, the lottery that he hath devised in these three chests of gold, silver, and lead, whereof who chooses his meaning chooses you, will no doubt never be chosen by any rightly but one who, sh who shall rightly love. But what warmth is there in your affection toward any of these princely suitors that are already come? I pray thee, overname them, and as thou namest them, I will describe them, and according to my description, level at my affection. First, there is the Neapolitan prince. He doth nothing but talk of his horse. <laughs> I am much afeard my lady, his mother, played false with a smith. Then there is the county Palatine. He doth nothing but frown. I fear he will prove the weeping philosopher when he grows old, being so full of unmannerly sadness in his youth. I had rather be married to a death's head with a bone in his mouth than to either of these. God defend me from these two. How say you by the French lord, Monsieur Le Bon? God made him and therefore let him pass for a man. <laughs> what say you then to Falconbridge, the young baron of England? You know, I say nothing to him, for he understands not me nor I him. He hath neither Latin. French nor Italian, and you will come into the court and swear that I have a poor penny worth in the English. He is a proper man's picture, but alas, who can converse with a dumb show? How like you the young German, the Duke of Saxony's nephew? Very vilely in the morning when he is sober, and most vilely in the afternoon when he's drunk. If he should offer to choose and choose the right casket, you should refuse to perform your father's will if you should refuse to accept him. Therefore, for fear of the worst, I pray thee set a deep glass of Rhenish wine on the contrary casket. For if the devil be within and that temptation without, I know he will choose it. Oh, I will do anything, Nerissa, ere I'll be married to a sponge. You need not fear, lady, the having of any of these lords. They have acquainted me with their determinations, which is indeed to return to their home and to trouble you with no more suit, unless you may be won by some other sort than your father's imposition, depending on the caskets. If I live to be as old as Sibylla, I will die as chaste as Diana, unless I be obtained by the manner of my father's will. I'm glad this parcel of wooers are so reasonable, for there is not one among them, but I dote on his very absence, and I pray God grant them a fair departure. Do you not remember, lady, in your father's time, a Venetian, a scholar and a soldier that came hither in company of the Marquis de Montferrat? Uh, yes, uh, yes, it was uh, Bassanio, as I, th I think he was so called. 
he, of all the men that ever my foolish eyes looked upon, was the most deserving of a fair lady. I remember him well, and I remember him worthy of thy praise. How now? What news? The four strangers seek for you, madam, to take their leave, and there is a forerunner come from a fifth, the Prince of Morocco, who brings word the prince his master will be here tonight. If I could bid the fifth welcome with so good a heart as I can bid the other four farewell, I should be glad of his approach. Come, Nerissa. Sarah, go before. Whilst we shut the gates upon one wooer, another knocks at the door. Scene three, Venice, a public place. Enter Bassanio and Shylock. 3,000 ducats, well. Aye, sir, for three months. For three months, well. For the which, as I told you, Antonio shall be bound. Antonio shall become bound. Well. May you steed me? Will you pleasure me? Shall I know your answer? 3,000 ducats for three months and Antonio bound. Your answer to that? Antonio is a good man. Have you heard any imputation to the contrary? Oh, no, 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 no. My, my meaning in saying he is a good man is to have you understand me that he is sufficient. Yet his means are in supposition. He hath an argosy bound to Tripoli, another to the Indies, I understand moreover upon the Rialto. He hath a third at Mexico, a fourth at England, and other ventures he hath squandered abroad. But ships are but boards, sailors but men. There be land rats and water rats, water thieves and land thieves. I mean pirates. And then there is the peril of the waters, winds, rocks, the man is notwithstanding sufficient. 3,000 ducats, I think I may take his bond. Be assured you may. I will be assured I may, and that I may be assured I will bethink me. May I speak with Antonio? If it please you to dine with us. <laughs> yes, to smell pork. I will buy with you, sell with you, talk with you, walk with you, and so following, but I will not eat with you, drink with you, nor pray with you. What news on the Rialto? Who is he comes here? This is Signor Antonio. How like a fawning publican he looks. <laughs> I hate him. For that in low simplicity he lends out money gratis and brings down the rate of usance here with us in Venice. I will feed fat the ancient grudge I bear him. He hates our sacred nation and he rails even there where the merchants most do congregate on me, my bargains and my well-won thrift, which he calls interest. Shylock, do you hear? Uh, I'm debating of my present store, and by the near guess of my memory, I cannot instantly raise up the gross of full 3,000 ducats. What of that? Tubal, a wealthy Hebrew of my tribe, will furnish me, uh, but soft, how many months do you desire? Rest you, fair, good senor, your worship was the last man in our mouths. Sherlock, although I neither lend nor borrow by taking nor by giving of excess, yet to supply the ripe wants of my friend, I'll break a custom. Is he yet possessed? How much he would? Aye, aye, three thousand ducats. And for three months. I have forgot. Three months. You told me so. Well then, your bond, and let me see. Uh, but hear you... Methought you said you neither lend nor borrow upon advantage? I do never use it. When Jacob grazed his uncle Laban's sheep, this Jacob from our holy Abram was... And what of him? Did he take interest? No, not take interest. Not, as you would say, directly interest. Mark what Jacob did. When Laban and himself were compromised, that all the inlings which were streaked and pied should fall as Jacob's hire. 
the ewes being rank in the end of autumn turned to the rams and when the work of generation was between these woolly breeders and the axe the skillful shepherd peeled me certain wands and in the doing of the deed of kind he stuck them up before the false amuse who then conceiving did in eating time fall party colored lambs and those were jacob's this was a way to thrive and he was blessed and thrift is blessing if men steal it not was this inserted to make interest good or is your gold and silver use and ramps i cannot tell i make it breed as fast but note me, senor. Mark you this, Bassanio. The devil can cite scripture for his purpose. An evil sooth producing holy witness is like a villain with a smiling cheek. A goodly apple rotten at the heart. Oh, what a goodly outside falsehood hath. Three thousand ducats. Tis a good round sum. Three months from twelve. Then let me see the rate. Well, Starlock, shall we be beholding to you? Senor Antonio. Many a time and oft in the Rialto, you have rated me about my monies and my usances till I have borne it with the patient shrug for sufferance is the badge of all our tribe. You call me misbeliever, a cutthroat dog and spit upon my Jewish gabardine and all for use of that which is mine own. Well, then it now appears you need my help. Go to then. You come to me and you say, Shylock, we would have monies. You say so. You that did void your room upon my beard and put me as you spurn a stranger cur over your threshold. Monies is your suit. What should I say to you? Should I not say half a dog money? Is it possible a cur can lend 3,000 ducats? Or Shall I bend low and in a bondman's key with bated breath and whispering humbleness say this, fair sir, you spit on me Wednesday last, you spurned me such a day, another time you called me dog, and for these courtesies I'll lend you thus much monies. I am as like to call thee so again, to spit on thee again, to spurn thee to, if thou wilt lend this money, lend it not as to thy friends. For when did friendship take a breed for barren metal of his friend? But lend it rather to thine enemy, who if he break, thou mayest with better face exact the penalty. Why look you how you storm? I would be friends with you and have your love forgive the shames that you have stained me with. Supply your present wants and take no thought of usance for my monies and you'll not hear me. This is kind I offer. This were kindness. This kindness I will show. Go with me to a notary and seal me there your single bond. And in a merry sport, if you repay me not on such a day, in such a place, such sums or sums as they are expressed in the condition, let the forfeit be nominated for an equal pound of your fair flesh to be cut off and taken in which part of your body pleaseth me. Content, if faith. I'll seal to such a bond and say there is much kindness in the Jew. You shall not seal to such a bond for me. I'll rather dwell in my necessity. Why fear not, man, I will not forfeit it. Within these two months, that's a month before this bond expires, I do expect return of thrice three times the value of his bond. <laughs> Father Abram, what these Christians are, whose own hard dealings teaches them suspect the thoughts of others. Pray you tell me this. If he should break his day, what should I gain by the exaction of the forfeiture? A pound of man's flesh taken from a man is not so estimable, profitable, neither as flesh of buttons, beefs, or goats, I say, to buy his favor, I extend this friendship. If he will take it, so... If not, adieu. And for my love, I pray you, wrong me not. Yes, Shylock, I will seal unto this bond. Then meet me forthwith at the notary. Give him direction for this merry bond, and I will go and purse the duck at straight. Hide thee, gentle Jew. The Hebrew will turn Christian. He grows kind. I like not fair terms in the villain's mind. Come on, in this there can be no dismay. My ships come 
home a month before the day. Act two, scene one, Belmont, a room in Portia's house. Flourish of cornets. Enter the Prince of Morocco, Portia, and Nerissa. Therefore, I pray you, lead me to the caskets to try my fortune. You must take your chance and either not attempt to choose at all or swear before you choose, if you choose wrong, never to speak to Lady Afterward in way of marriage. Therefore, be advised. Nor will not. Come, bring me unto my chance. First forward to the temple. After dinner, your hazard shall be made. Good fortune, then, to make me blessed or cursed among men. Scene two, Venice, a street. Enter Lancelot. Certainly my conscience will serve me to run from this Jew, my master. Oh, the fiend is at mine elbow and tempts me, saying to me, Gobbo, Lancelot Gobbo, good Lancelot, or good Gobbo, or good Lancelot Gobbo, use your legs, take the start, run away. My conscience says, no, take heed, honest Lancelot, take heed, honest Gobbo, or as aforesaid, honest Lancelot Gobbo, do not run. Scorn running with thy heels, well, the most courageous fiend bids me, bids me pack. Via, says the fiend, away, says the fiend. For the heavens rouse up a brave mind, says the fiend, and run. Well, my conscience, hanging about the neck of my heart, says very wisely to me, my honest friend Lancelot, being an honest man's son, or rather an honest woman's son, for indeed my father did something smack, something grow too, he had a kind of taste. Well, my conscience says, Lancelot, budge not. Budge, says the fiend. Budge not, says my conscience. Conscience, say I, you counsel well. Fiend, say I you counsel well. To be ruled by my conscience, I should stay with the Jew, my master, who, God bless his mark, is a kind of devil. And to run away with the Jew, from the Jew, I should be ruled by the fiend, who, saving your reverence, is the devil himself. Certainly the Jew is the very devil and carnal, and in my conscience, my conscience is but a kind of hard conscience to offer to counsel me to stay with the Jew. The fiend gives the more friendly counsel, I will run, fiend. My heels are at your command. I will run. Oh, rare fortune. Here comes Master Bassanio, who indeed gives rare new liveries. If I serve not him, I will run as far as God has any ground, for I am a Jew if I serve the Jew any longer. God bless your worship. Gramercy, wouldst thou aught with me? I hath a great infection, sir, as one would say, to serve. What would you? Serve you, sir. That is the very defect of the matter, sir. I know thee well. Thou hast obtained thy suit. Go, take leave of thy old master and inquire my lodging out. Give him a livery, more guarded than his fellows. See it done. Well, if fortune be a woman, she's a good wench for this gear. I'll take my leave of the Jew in the twinkling of an eye. Signor Bassiano! Gratiano! I have a suit to you! You've obtained it! Oh, you must not deny me! I must go with you to Belmont! Why, then you must. But hear thee, Gratiano. Thou art too wild, too rude, and bold of voice. Parts that become thee happily enough, and in such eyes as our appear not false. But where thou art known, where thou art not known, why, there they show something too liberal. Pray thee, take pain to allay with some cold drops of modesty thy skipping spirit, lest through the wild behavior I be misconstrued in the place I go to and lose my hopes. Signor Bassanio, hear me. If I do not put on a sober habit, talk with respect, and swear but now and then, Wear prayer books in my pocket, look demurely, nay more while Grace is saying, hood my eyes, thus with my hat, and sigh and say, amen. Use all the observance of civility like one well studied in a sad ostent to please his grandam. 
never trust me more. Well, we shall see your bearing. Nay, but I to bar tonight. You shall not gauge me by what we do tonight. No, that were pity. I would entreat you rather to put on your boldest suit of mirth, for we have friends that propose merriment. But fare you well, I have some business. And I must to Lorenzo and to the rest. But we will visit you at supper time. Scene three. The same. A room in Shylock's house. Enter Jessica and Lancelot. I am sorry thou wilt leave my father so. Our house is hell, and thou, a merry devil, didst rob it of some taste of tediousness. But uh, fare thee well, there is a ducat for thee. And Lancelot, soon at supper shalt thou see Lorenzo, who is my new master's guest. Give him this letter, do it secretly, and so farewell. I would not have my father see me and talk with thee. Adieu, and tears exhibit my tongue. Most beautiful pagan, most sweet Jew. If a Christian did not play the knave and get thee, I much deceived. But <clears throat> adieu, these foolish drops do something drown my manly spirit. Adieu. Farewell, good Lancelot. <sighs> Alack, what heinous sin is it in me to be a shame to be my father's child. Though I am daughter to his blood, I am not to his manners. Oh, Lorenzo, if thou keep promise, I shall end the strife, become a Christian, and thy loving wife. Scene four, the same, a street. Enter Gratiano, Lorenzo, Salarino, and Celano. Nay, we will slink away in supper time, disguise us at my lodging, and return all in an hour. We have not made good preparation. We have not spoke us yet of torchbearers. Tis vile, unless it may be quaintly ordered, and better in my mind not undertook. Tis now but four o'clock. We have two hours to furnish us. Friend, Launcelot, what's the news? It shall please you to break up this, it shall seem to signify. I know the hand. In faith, tis a fair hand. Love news of faith! <laughs> By your leave, sir. Whither goest thou? Marry, sir, to bid my old master, the Jew, to sup tonight with my new master, the Christian. Well, hold here. Uh, take this. Tell gentle Jessica I will not fail her. Speak it privately. Go! Gentlemen, will you prepare for this mask tonight? I am provided of a torchbearer. Aye, Mary, I'll be gone and about it straight. And so will I. Meet me and Gratiano at Gratiano's lodgings some hour hence. Tis good we do so. Was not that letter from fair Jessica? <laughs> I must needs tell thee all. <laughs> She hath directed how I shall take her from her father's house, what gold and jewels she is furnished with, what pages suit she hath in readiness, if e'er the Jew her father come to heaven, it will be for his gentle daughter's sake. <laughs> come, go with me, peruse this as thou goest. Fair Jessica shall be my torchbearer. <laughs> Scene five, the same. Before Shylock's house, enter Shylock and Lancelot. Well, thou shalt see, thy eyes shall be the judge, the difference of old Shylock and Bassanio. What, Jessica, thou shalt not gormandize as thou hast done with me. What, Jessica, Ugh, and sleep and snore and rend apparel out. Why, Jessica, I say. Why, Jessica? Who bids thee call? I did not bid thee call. Your worship was wont to tell me that I could do nothing without bidding. Call you, what is your will? I am bid forth to supper, Jessica. But wherefore should I go? I am not bid for love, they flatter me. But yet, 
I will go in hate. Jessica, my girl, look to my house. I am right loath to go. I beseech you, sir, go. My young master doth ex expect your reproach. So do I his. And they have conspired together. I will not say you shall see a mask, but if you do, then it was not for nothing that my nose fell a-bleeding on Monday last at six o'clock in the morning. What, are there masks? Uh, hear you me, Jessica, lock up my doors, and when you hear the drum, clamor not you up to the casement then to gaze on Christian fools with varnished faces, but stop my house's ears, I mean my casements, and let not the sound of shallow foppery enter my sober house. By Jacob's staff, I swear, I have no mind of feasting forth tonight, but I will go. Go you before me, Sira, say I will come. I will go before, sir. Mistress, look out at window for all this. There will come a Christian boy that will be worth a Jewess's eye. What says that fool, huh? Uh, his word, Miss Thermel. Farewell, mistress, nothing more. <clears throat> the catch is kind enough, but a huge feeder. Therefore, I part with him. And part with him to one that would have helped him waste his borrowed purse. Well, Jessica, go in. Perhaps I will return immediately. Do as I bid you, shut doors after you, fast find, fast find, a bro proverb, never stale in thrifty mind. Farewell, if my fortune be not crossed, I have a father, you a daughter, lost. Scene six, the same. Enter Gratiano and Salarino, masked. This is the penthouse under which Lorenzo desired us to make stand. His hour is almost past. And it is marvel he outdwells his hour, for lovers ever run before the clock. Oh, ten times faster Venus's pigeons fly to seal love's bonds new made than they were wont than they are wont to keep obliged faith unforfeited. Sweet friends. Your patience for my long abode, not I, but my affair, have made you wait. When you shall please to play the thieves for wives, I'll watch as long for you then. Approach, here dwells my father Jew. Oh, what's within? Who are you? Tell me, for certainly, albeit I'll swear that I do know you of your tongue. <laughs> Lorenzo and thy love. Lorenzo, certain, and my love indeed, for who <laughs> love I so much? And now, who knows but you, Lorenzo, whether I am yours? Heaven, and thy thoughts are witness that thou art. Oh, here, catch this casket. Uh, it is worth the pains. I am glad tis night. You do not look on me, for I am much ashamed of my exchange. But love is blind, and... Lovers cannot see the pretty follies that themselves commit. For if they could, Cupid himself would blush to see me thus transformed to a boy. Well, descend, for you must be my torchbearer. What? But must I hold a candle to my shames? Are they in themselves, good sooth, or too, too light? Why, tis an office of discovery, love, and I should be obscured. So are you, sweet even in the lovely garnish of a boy. But come at once, for the close night doth play the runaway, and we are stayed for at Bassiano's feast. I will make fast the doors and yield myself with some more ducats and be with you straight. <laughs> now by my hood, a Gentile and no Jew? <laughs> Beshrew me, but I love her heartily. <laughs> For she is wise, if I could judge her. And fair she is, if that mine eyes be true. And true she is, as she has proved herself. <laughs> oh, and therefore, like herself, wise, fair, and true, shall she be placed in my constant soul. What? Art thou come? On, gentlemen, away! Our masking mates by this time for us stay. Who's there? Signor Antonio? Bye, bye, Gradiano. Where are all the rest? 
Tis nine o'clock, our friends all stay for you. No mask tonight? The wind is come about. Bassiano presently will go aboard. I have sent twenty out to seek for you. I am glad, aunt. I desire no more delight than to be under sail and gone tonight. Scene seven. Belmont. A room in Portia's house. Flourish of cornets. Enter Portia with the Prince of Morocco. Oh, draw aside the curtains and discover the several caskets to this noble prince. Now make your choice. The first of gold, this inscription bears, who chooseth me shall gain what many men desire. The second silver, which this promise carries, who chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves. This third dull lead with warning all is blunt, who chooseth me must give and hazard all he hath. How shall I know if I do choose the right? The one of them contains my picture, Prince. If you choose that, then I am yours withal. Some God direct my judgment. Let me see. I will survey the inscriptions back again. What says this leaden casket? Who chooseth me must give and hazard all he hath. Must give? For what? For lead? Hazard for lead? This casket threatens. Men that hazard all do it in hope of a fair advantages. A golden mind stoops not to shows of dross. I'll then not give her hazard off her lead. What says the silver with her virgin hue? Who, choo who chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves. As much as he deserves? Pause there, Morocco, and weigh thy value with an even hand. <sighs> if thou best rated by thy estimation, thou dost deserve enough, and yet enough may not extend so far as to the lady. And yet to be afeard of my deserving were but a weak disabling of myself. As much as I deserve, why, that's the lady. I do in birth deserve her and in fortunes, in graces and in qualities of breeding. But more than these, in love, I, I do deserve. What if I stir no further but chose here? Let's see once more this saying graved in gold. Who chooseth me shall gain what many men desire. Why? That's the lady, all the world desires her. From the four corners of the earth they come to kiss the shrine, this mortal breathing saint. One of these three contains your heavenly picture. Isn't it like that lead contains her? Toward damnation to think so base a thought, it were too gross. Or shall I think in silver she's immured, being ten times undervalued to try gold? What sinful thought. Deliver me the key. How do I choose and thrive I as I may? There, take it, Prince. And if my form lie there, then I am yours. He unlocks the gold casket. Oh, hell. What have we here? A carrion death within whose empty eye there is a written scroll. I'll read the writing. All that glitters is not gold. Often have you heard that told. Many a man his life hath sold, but my outside to behold. Gilded tombs do worms in fold. Have you been as, as wise as bold? Young in limbs is judgment old. Your answer had not been inscrolled. Fare you well, your suit is cold, cold indeed, and labor lost. Then farewell heat and welcome frost. <sighs> Portia, adieu. I have to grieve to heart to take a tedious leave. This loser's part. A gentle riddance. Draw the curtains, go. Scene eight. Venice. A street. Enter Salarino and Saliano. Why, man? I saw Bassanio under sail. With him is Gratiano gone along, and in their ship I'm sure Lorenzo is not. The villain Jew with outcries raised the Duke, who went with him to search Bassiano's ship. He came too late. The ship was under sail. But there the Duke was given to understand that in a gondola were seen together Lorenzo and his amorous Jessica. 
Besides, Antonio certified the Duke that they were not with Bassanio on his ship. I never heard a passion so confused, so strange, outrageous, and so variable. As the dog Jew did utter in the streets, my daughter, oh my duckess, oh my daughter, fled with a Christian, oh my Christian duckess, justice, the law, my duckess, and my daughter. Why all the boys in Venice follow him, crying his stones, his daughter, his ducats. Let good Antonio look, he keep his day, or shall, or he shall pay for this. Mary, well remembered. I reasoned with a Frenchman yesterday who told me in the narrow seas that part, the French and English, were there miscarried a vessel of our country richly fraught. I thought upon Antonio when he told me and wished in silence that it were not his. You are best to tell Antonio what you hear. Yet, do not suddenly, for it may grieve him. A kinder gentleman tre treads not the earth. I saw Bassanio and Antonio part. Bassanio told him he would make some speed of his return. He answered, do not so, slubber, but not business for my sake, Bassanio, but stay the very riping of the time. And for the Jew's bond which he hath of me, let it not enter in your mind of love. Be merry, and employ your chiefest thoughts to courtship, and such fair ostents of love as shall conveniently become you there. And even there, his eye being big with tears, turning his face, he put his hand behind him, and with affection wondrous sensible, he wrung Bassanio's hand, and so they parted. I think he only loves the world for him. Mm. I pray thee, let us go and find him out and quicken his embrace heaviness with some delight or other. Do we so? Scene nine, Belmont, a room in Portia's house. Enter Nerissa. Quick, quick, I pray thee, draw the curtain straight. The Prince of Aragon hath ta'en his oath and comes to his election presently. Flourish of cornets. Enter. Enter the Prince of Aragon and Portia. Behold, there stand the caskets, noble prince. If you choose that wherein I am contained, straight shall our nuptial rites be solemnized. But if you fail, Without more speech, my lord, you must be gone from hence immediately. I am enjoined by oath to observe three things. First, never to unfold to anyone which casket twas I chose. Next, if I fail of the right casket, never in my life to woo a maid in way of marriage. Lastly, if I do fail in fortune of my choice, immediately to leave you and be gone. To these injunctions, everyone doth swear that comes to hazard for my worthless self. And so have I addressed me. Fortune now to my heart's hope, gold, silver, and base lead, who chooseth me must give and hazard all he hath. You shall look fairer ere I give or hazard. What says the golden chest? <laughs> Let me see. Who chooseth me shall gain what many men desire. What many men desire? That many may be meant by the full multitude that choose by show. I will not choose what many men desire, because I will not jump with common spirits and rank me with the barbarous multitudes. Why then to thee, thou silver treasure house, tell me once more what title thou dost bear. Who chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves. And well said too. For who shall go about to cousin fortune and be honorable without the stamp of merit? Let none presume to wear an undeserved dignity. Oh, 
that estates, degrees, and offices were not derived corruptly, and that clear honor were purchased by the merit of the wearer. Who chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves. I will assume desert. Give me a key for this and instantly unlock my fortunes here. He opens the silver casket. Too long a pause for that which you find there. What's here? The portrait of a blinking idiot presenting me a schedule? I will read it. As fire seven times tried this, seven times tried that judgment is that did never choose a miss. Some there be shadows kiss, such have but a shadows bliss. <laughs> There be fools alive, I wis, silvered o'er, and so was this. Take what wife you will to bed, I will ever be your head. So be gone, you are sped. Still the more fool I shall appear by the time I linger here. Sweet adieu, I'll keep my oath patiently to bear my wrong. <laughs> uh, thus hath the candle thinned <laughs> the moth. <laughs> Madam, there is alighted at your gate a young Venetian, one that comes before to signify the approaching of his lord, from whom he bringeth sensible regrets. To wit, besides commends and courteous breath, gifts of rich value. Yet I have not seen so likely an ambassador of love. A day in April never came so sweet to show how costly summer was at hand as this forsfarer comes before his lord. No more, I pray thee. I am half afeard thou wilt say anon he is some kin to thee. Thou spend such high day wit in praising him. Uh, come, come, Nerissa, for I long to see quick Cupid's post that comes so mannerly. Bassanio, Lord Love, if thy will it be. Act three, scene one, Venice. A street. Enter Saliano and Salarino. Now what news on the Rialto? Why, yet it lives there unchecked that Antonio hath a ship of rich landing wrecked on the narrow seas. Good Antonio, the honest Antonio. Oh, that I had a title good enough to keep his name company. Hath lost a ship. I would it might prove the end of his losses. Let me say amen betimes, lest the devil cross my prayer, for here he comes in the likeliness of a Jew. How now, Shylock? What news among the merchants? You know none so well. None so well as you of my daughter's flight. Well, that's certain. I, for my part, knew the tailor that made the wings she flew with all. And Shylock, for his own part, knew that a bird was fledged, and then it is in the complexion of them all to leave the dam. She's damned for it. That's certain, if the devil may be her judge. My own flesh and blood to rebel. Out upon it, old Carrion, rebels it at these years. I say my daughter is my flesh and blood. There is more difference between thy flesh and hers than between jet and ivory. More between your bloods than there is between red wine and Rhenish. But tell us, do you hear whether Antonio have had any loss at sea or no? There I have another bad match, a bankrupt, a prodigal who dare scarce show his head on the Rialto, a beggar that was used to come so smug upon the mart. Let him look to his bond. He was wont to call me usurer. Let him look to his bond. He was wont to lend money for a Christian courtesy. Let him look to his bond. 
why I am sure if he forfeit, thou wilt not take his flesh. What's that good for? To bait fish withal. If it will feed nothing else, it will feed my revenge. He hath disgraced me and hindered me half a million, laughed at my losses, mocked at my gains, scorned my nation, thwarted my bargains, cooled my friends, heated mine enemies, and what's his reason? I am a Jew. I have not a Jew eyes, hath not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions, fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapon, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is. If you do prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. If a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? Revenge. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be by Christian example? <laughs> Why, revenge. The villainy you teach me, I will execute, and it shall go hard, but I will be better by the instruction. Here comes another of the tribe. A, a third cannot be matched unless the devil himself turn Jew. How now, Tuba? What news from Genoa? Hast thou found my daughter? I often came where I did hear of her, but cannot find her. A diamond gone cost me two thousand ducats in Frankfurt. The curse never fell upon our nation till now. I never felt it till now. Two thousand ducats in that? And other precious, precious jewels. I would my daughter were dead at my foot and the jewels in her ear. Would she were hearsed at my foot and the ducats in her coffin. The thief gone with so much. And so much to find the thief and no satisfaction, no revenge, nor no luck in stirring but what lights on my shoulders, no sighs but of my breathing, no tears but of my shedding. Yes, other men have ill luck too. Antonio, as I heard in Genoa. What, what, what? Ill luck? Ill luck? Hath an argosy cast away, coming from Tripoli. I thank God. I thank God. It's true, it's true. I spoke with some of the sailors that escaped the wreck. Thank thee, good Tubal. Good news, good news. <laughs> Where, in Genoa? Your daughter spent in Genoa, as I heard, in one night four score ducats. Oh, sticks a dagger in me. I shall never see my gold again. Four score duc ducats at a sitting? Four score ducats? There came diverse of Antonio's creditors in my company to Venice that swear he cannot choose but break. I'm very glad of it. I'll plague him. I'll torture him. I am glad of it. One of them showed me a ring that he had of your daughter for a monkey. Out upon her. Oh, thou torturest me, too, but it was my turquoise. I had it of Leah when I was a bachelor. I would not have given it for a wilderness of monkeys. But Antonio is certainly undone. Hey, that's true. That's very true. Go, Tubal. Be me an officer. Bespeak him a fortnight before. I will have the heart of him if he forfeit. For were he out of Venice, I can make what merchandise I will. Go, go, Tubal, and meet me at our synagogue. Go, good Tubal, at our synagogue. Tubal. Scene two. Belmont. <sighs> a room in Portia's house. Enter Bassanio, Portia, Gratiano, and Nerissa. I pray you, Terry, pause a day or two before you hazard, for in choosing wrong I lose your company. Therefore forbear a while. There's something tells me, uh, but, but it is not love. Uh, I would not lose you. And you know yourself, hate counsels not in such a quality. Uh, but lest you should not understand me well, I would detain you here some month or two before you venture for me. I could teach you how to choose right. 
But I am then forsworn. So will I never be. So you may miss me. But if you do, you'll make me wish a sin that I had been forsworn. But true your eyes that have o'erlooked me and divided me. One half of me is yours, the other half yours. A mine own, I would say, but if mine, then yours, and so all yours. Oh, these naughty times put bars between the owners and their rights. And so, though yours, not yours. Prove it so, let fortune go to hell for it, not I. I speak too long. It is to pace the time, to eke it out, and to draw it out in length to stay you from election. Let me choose. For as I am, I live upon the rack. Upon the rack, Pisanio? Then confess what treason there is mingled with your love. None but that ugly treason of mistrust, which makes me fear the enjoying of my love. There may as well be amity and life between snow and fire as treason and my love. Aye, but I fear you speak upon the rack where men enforced to speak anything. Promise me life, and I'll confess the truth. Well then, confess and live. Confess and love had been the very sum of my confession. <laughs> Happy torment when my torture doth teach me answers for deliverance, but let me to my fortune and the caskets. Away then, I am locked in one of them. If you do love me, you will find me out. Uh, Nerissa and the rest stand all aloof. He may win. Oh, now he goes. Go, Hercules, live thou, I live. With much, much more dismay, I view the fight than thou that makest the fray. Uh, let music sound while he doth make his choice. <laughs> Tell me where is fancy bread? Or in the heart, or in the head? Where be got? Where nourish it? Tis engendered in the eyes. With gazing fed and fancy dies in the cradle where it lies. Let us soaring fancies now I'll begin a ding dong bell. So may the outward shows be least themselves. The world is still deceived with ornament. In law, what plea so tainted and corrupt, but being seasoned with a gracious voice obscures the show of evil. In religion, what damned error but some sober brow will bless it and approve it with a text, hiding the grossness with fair ornament. There is no vice so simple but assumes some mark of virtue on his outward parts. How many cowards, whose hearts are all as false as stains of sand, were yet upon their chins the beards of Hercules and frowning Mars? Thus ornament is but the guiled shore to a most dangerous sea. In a word, the seeming truth which cunning times put on to enwrap and trap the wisest. Therefore, thou gaudy gold, hard food for Medias, Midias, I will none of thee, nor none of thee, thou pale and common drudge between man and man, but thou, thou merger lead which rather threatenest that dost promise aught, thy paleness moves me more than eloquence. And here choose I. Joy be the consequence. How all other passions flee to air as doubtful thoughts and rash embrace despair and shuddering fear and green-eyed jealousy. Oh, love, be moderate. <laughs> Allay thy ecstasy. In measure reign thy choice. Can't this excess... Oh, I feel too much thy blessing. Make it less for fear I surf it. What find I here? Opening the leaden casket. Fair Portia's counterfeit. What demi-god hath come so near creation? Move these eyes, or whether riding on the balls of mine. Seem they in motion? Yet look. 
How far the substance of my praise doth wrong the shadow in underprising it, in underprising it so fair that the shadow doth limp behind the substance. Here's the scroll, the continent and summary of my fortune. You that choose not by the view, chance as fair and choose as true. Since this fortune falls to you, be content and seek no new. If you be well pleased with this, and hold you your fortune for your bliss, turn you where your lady is, and claim her with a loving kiss. A gentle scroll. Fair lady, by your leave I come by note, to give and to receive like one of two contending in a prize, that thinks he hath done well in people's eyes. Hearing applause and universal shout, giddy in spirit, still gazing in a doubt, whether these pearls of praise be his or no. So thrice, fair lady, stand I, even so, as doubtful whether what I see be true, until confirmed, signed, ratified by you. You see me, Lord Vasanio, where I stand, such as I am. Though for myself alone I would not be ambitious in my wish to wish myself much better, yet for you I would be trebled twenty times myself, a thousand times more fair, ten thousand times more rich, that only to stand high in your account I might in virtue, beauties, livings, friends, exceed account. But the full sum of me is sum of something which to term engrosses an unlessened girl, unschooled, unpracticed. Happy in this, she is not yet so old, but she may learn. Happier than this, she is not bred so dull, but she can learn. Happiest of all is that her gentle spirit commits itself to yours to be directed as from her Lord, her governor, her king. Myself and what is mine to you and yours is now converted. But now I was the lord of this fair mansion, master of my servants, queen or myself. And even now, but now, this house, these servants, and this same myself are yours, my lord. I give them with this ring, which when you part from, lose, or give away, let it presage the ruin of your love and be my vantage to exclaim on you. Madam. You have bereft me of all words. Only my blood speaks to you in my veins. There is such confusion in my powers as after some oration fairly spoke by a beloved prince, there doth appear among the buzzing pleased multitude where every something being blent together turns to a wild of nothing, save of joy, expressed and not expressed. But when this ring parts from this finger, then parts life from hence. Or then be bold to say Bassiano's dead. My lord and lady, it is now our time that has stood by and seen our wishes prosper to cry good joy. <laughs> good joy, my lord and lady. My lord Bassiano and my gentle lady, I wish you all the joy that you can wish for I am sure you can wish none from me. And when your honors mean to solemnize the bargain of your faith, I do beseech you, even at that time, I may be married so. With all my heart, so thou canst get a wife. I thank your lordship, you have got me one. My eyes, my lord, can look as swift as yours. You saw the mistress. I beheld the maid. Your fortune stood upon the casket there, and so did mine too, as the matter falls. For wooing here until I sweat again, and sweating until my very roof was dry. With o's of love at last, it promised last. I got a promise of this fair one here to have her love provided that your fortune achieved her mistress. Is this true, Nerissa? Madam, it is. So you stand pleased with all. And do you, Gratiano, mean good faith? Yes, faith, my lord. Our feast shall be much honored in your marriage. 
We'll play with them the first boy for a thousand ducats. What? And stake down? No. We shall ne'er win at that sport and stake down. But who comes here? Lorenzo and his infidel? What? And my old Venetian friend, Salarnio? Lorenzo and Salarino, welcome hither. If that the youth of my new interest here have power to bid you welcome, by your leave, I bid my very friends and countrymen, sweet Portia, welcome. So do I, my lord. They are entirely welcome. I thank your honor. Uh, for my part, my lord, my purpose was not to have seen you here, um, but meeting with Salarino, by the way, he did entreat me past all saying nay to come along with him. I did, my lord, and I have reason for it. Signor Antonio commends him to you. Ere I ope this, ere, ere I ope his letter, I pray you, give, tell me how my good friend doth. Not sick, my lord, unless it be in mind, uh, nor well, unless in mind. His letter there will show you his estate. There is a cheer, yon stranger. Bid her welcome. Your hand, Salarnio. What's the news from Venice? How doth that royal merchant, good Antonio? I know he will be glad of our success. We are the Jasons! We have won the fleece! I would you had won the fleece that he hath lost. There are some shrewd contents in yon same paper that steals the color from Bassanio's cheek. Some dear friend dead, else nothing in the world could turn so much the constitution of any constant man. What? Worse and worse? With leave, Bassanio, I am half yourself, and I must freely have the half of anything that this same paper brings you. Oh, sweet Portia, here are a few of the unpleasant words that ever blotted paper. Gentle lady, when I did first impart my love to you, I freely told you all the wealth I had ran in my veins. I was a gentleman, and then I told you true. And yet, dear lady, rating myself at nothing, you shall see how much I was... I was a braggart. When I told you my state was nothing, I should then have told you that I was worse than nothing. For indeed, I have engaged myself to a dear friend, engaged my friend to his mere enemy to feed my means. Here is a letter, lady. The paper as the body of my friend and every word in it a gaping wound, issuing life blood. But is it true, Salarino? Have all his ventures failed? What, not one hit? From Tripoli? From Mexico and England? From Lisbon? Barbary and India? And not one vessel escaped the dreadful touch of merchant marrying rocks? Not one, my lord. Besides, it should appear that if he had the present money to discharge the Jew, he would not take it. 20 merchants the Duke himself and the Magnificos of greatest port have all persuaded with him, but none can drive him from the envious plea of forfeiture of justice and his bond. Um, when I was with him, I have heard him swear that he would rather have Antonio's flesh than 20 times the value of the sum that he did owe him. And, and I know, my lord, if law, authority, and power deny not it will go hard with poor Antonio. Is it your dear friend that is thus in trouble? Dearest friend to me, the kindest man, the best conditioned and unwearied spirit in doing courtesies, and one in whom the ancient Roman honor more appears than any that draws breath in Italy. What sum was he the Jew? For me, 3,000. For me, 3,000 ducats. <laughs> What? No more? Well, pay him 6,000 and deface the bond. And a double 6,000 and then treble that before a friend of this description shall lose a hair through Bassanio's fault. First, go with me to church and call me wife. 
and then away to Venice to your friend, for never shall you lie by Portia's side with an unquiet soul. You shall have gold to pay the petty debt 20 times over. When it is paid, bring your true friend along. <laughs> My maid, Larissa, and myself, meantime, will live as maids and widows. Come away, for you shall hence upon your wedding day. Bid your friends welcome, show a merry cheer. Since you are dear bought, I will love you dear. But let me hear the letter of your friend. Sweet Bassanio, my ships have all miscarried. My creditors grow cruel. My estate is very low. My bond to the Jew is forfeit. And since in paying it, it is impossible I should live. All depths are cleared between you and I. If I might but see you at my death, notwithstanding, use your pleasure. If your love do not persuade you to come, let not my letter. Oh, love, dispatch all business and be gone. Since I have your good leave to go away, I will make haste. But till I come again, nor better shall e'er be guilty of my stay, nor rest, nor no rest be interposer twixt us twain. intermission we will be back at 8 58 God, her ducky, her ducky, her ducky.
All right, please read us back on in. Scene three, Venice. A street? Enter Shylock, Salarito, Antonio, and Jailer. Jailer, look to him. Tell me not of mercy. This is the fool that lent out money gratis. Jailer, look to him. Hear me yet, good Shylock. I'll have my bond. Speak not against my bond. I have sworn an oath that I will have my bond. Thou calledst me a dog before thou hadst a cause. But since I am a dog, beware my fangs. The duke shall grant me justice. I do wonder, thou naughty jailer, that thou art so fond to come abroad with him at his request. I pray thee hear me speak. I'll have my bond, I will not hear thee speak. I'll have my bond, and therefore speak no more. I'll not be made a soft and dull-eyed fool to shake the head, relent, and sigh, and yield to Christian intercessors. Follow not, I'll have no speaking, I will have my bond. It is the most impenetrable cur that ever kept with men. Let him alone. I'll follow him no more with bootless prayers. He seeks my life. His reasons, well, I know, I oft delivered from his forfeitures. Many that have in many times made moan to me, therefore he hates me. I'm sure the Duke will never grant this forfeiture to hold. The Duke cannot deny the course of law. For the commodity the strangers have with us in Venice, if it be denied, would such impeach the justice of his state, since that the trade and profit of the city consisted of all nations, they forego. These griefs and losses have so baited me that I shall hardly spare a pound of flesh tomorrow to my bloody creditor. Will jailer on? May God Bassanio come to see me pay his debt. That I care not. Scene four. Belmont. A room in Portia's house. Enter Portia, Nerissa, Lorenzo, Jessica, and Balthazar. Madam, although I speak it in your presence, you have a noble and true conceit of godlike amity, which appears most strongly and bearing thus the absence of your Lord. But if you knew to whom you show this honor, how true a gentleman you send relief, how dear a lover of my Lord, your husband, I know you would be prouder of the work than customary bounty can enforce you. I never did repent for doing good, nor shall not now. For in companions that do converse and waste the time together, whose souls do bear an equal yoke of love, there must be needs a like proportion of lineaments, of manners, and of spirit. Which makes me think that this Antonio, being the bosom lover of my lord, must needs be like my lord. If it be so, how little is the cost I have bestowed in purchasing the semblance of my soul from out of the state of hellish misery? This comes too near the praising of myself, therefore no more of it. <laughs> Here are other things. Lorenzo, I commit into your hands the husbandry and manage of my house until my Lord's return. For mine own part, I have toward heaven breathed a secret vow to live in prayer and contemplation, only attended by Nerissa here, until her husband and my Lord's return. There is a monastery two miles off and there will we abide. I do desire you not to deny this imposition, the which my love and some necessity now lays upon you. Madam, with all my heart, I shall obey you in all fair commands. My people do already know my mind and will acknowledge you and Jessica in place of Lord Bassanio and myself. And so farewell till we shall meet again. Fair thoughts and happy hours attend on you. I wish your ladyship all heart's content. I thank you for your wish, and am well pleased to wish it back on you. Fare you well, Jessica. Now, Balthazar, as I have ever found the honest true, so let me find thee still. Uh, take this same letter 
and use thou all the endeavor of a man in speed to Padua. See thou render this into my cousin's hand, Dr. Bellario. And look, what notes and garments he doth give thee, bring them, I pray thee, with imagined speed unto the Trinect, to the common ferry which trades to Venice. Waste no time in words, but get thee gone. I shall be there before thee. Madam, I go with all convenient speed. Come on, Nerissa. I have work in hand that you yet know not of. We'll see our husbands before they think of us. Shall they see us? They shall, Nerissa, but in such a habit that they shall think we are accomplished with what we lack. I'll hold thee any wager when we are both accoutred like young men. I'll prove the prettier fellow of the two and wear my dagger with braver grace and speak between the change of man and boy with the reed voice. <laughs> I have within my mind a thousand raw tricks of these bragging jacks, which I will practice. What, shall we turn to men? I'll tell thee all my whole device when I am in my coach, which stays for us at the park gate. And therefore haste away. We must measure 20 miles today. Scene five, the same. A garden. Enter Lancelot and Jessica. Yes, truly, for look you, the sins of the father are to be laid upon the children. Therefore, I promise ye, I fear you. I was always plain with you, and so now I speak my agitation of the matter. Therefore, be of good cheer, for truly, I think you're damned. There is but one hope in it that can do you any good, and that is but a kind of bastard hope, neither. And what hope is that, I pray thee? Mary, you may partly hope that your father got you not, that you are not the Jew's daughter. That were a kind of bastard hope, indeed. So the sins of my mother should be visited upon me. Truly, then I fear you are damned both by father and mother. Thus, when I shun Scylla, your father, I fall into Caribdi, your mother, well, you are gone both ways. I shall be saved by my husband, who hath made me a Christian. Truly, the more to blame he. This making Christians will raise the price of hogs. If we grow all to be pork eaters, we shall not shortly have a rasher on the coals for money. I shall grow jealous of you shortly, Lancelot, if you thus get my wife into corners. <laughs> nay, nay, you need not fear us, Lorenzo. Lancelot and I are out. He tells me flatly, there is no mercy for me in heaven, because I am a Jew's daughter. And he says, you are no good member of the Commonwealth for converting Jews to Christians. You raise the price of pork. <laughs> I shall answer that. Better to the commonwealth than you can get the getting up of the servant's belly. The more is with child by you, Lancelot. <laughs> it is much that the more should be more than reason. But if she be less than an honest woman, she's indeed more than I took her for. <laughs> Go in, Sarah, bid them prepare for dinner. <laughs> that is done, sir. They all have stomachs. Goodly lord, what a wit snapper are you? <laughs> then bid them. Prepare dinner. That is done too, sir. Only cover is the word. Will you cover then, sir? Not so, sir, neither. I know my duty. Yet more quarreling with occasion. Wilt thou show the whole wealth of thy wit in an instant? I pray thee, understand a plain man in his plain meaning. Go to thy fellows, bid them cover the table, serve the meat, and we will come to dinner. For the table, sir, it shall be served in. For the meat, sir, it shall be covered. For your coming into dinner, sir, why, let it be as humors and conceits shall govern. Oh, dear discretion, how his words are suited. The fool hath planted in his memory an army of good words. And I do know many fools that stand in better place, garnished like him, that for tricksy word defy the matter. <laughs> How cheerest thou, Jessica? And now, good sweet, say thy opinion. How dost thou like the Lord Bassiano's wife? Past all expressing <laughs> is very meet the Lord Bassanio live an upright life for having such a blessing here on earth and 
if on earth he do not mean it, then in reason he should never come to heaven. But if to God should play some heavenly match and on the wager lay two earthly women and Portia one, there must be something else pawned with the other, for the poor rude world hath not her fellow. Even such a husband hast thou of me, as she is for a wife. I will anon first, or nay, but ask my opinion too of that. I will. Anon. First, let's go to dinner. Oh, nay, let me praise you while I have stomach. No, pray thee, let it serve for table talk. Then howsoe'er thou speakest, mung, other things I shall digest it. Act four. Scene one. Venice. A court of justice. Enter the Duke, Antonio, Bassanio, Gratiano, and Salarino. What is Antonio here? Ready, so please, your grace. I am sorry for thee. Thou art come to answer a stony adversary, an inhuman wretch, incapable of pity, void and empty from any dram of mercy. I have heard your grace hath taken great pains to qualify his rigorous course. But since he stands obdurate and that no lawful means can carry me out of his envy's reach, I do oppose my patience to his fury. And am armed to suffer with a quietness of spirit the very tyranny and rage of his. Go one and call the Jew into the court. He is ready at the door. He comes, my lord. Make room and let him stand before our face. Shylock, the world thinks, and I think so too, that thou but leads this fashion of thy malice to the last hour of the act. And then, tis thought thou'lt show thy mercy, and remorse more strange than is thy strange apparent cruelty. And where thou now exacts the penalty, which is a pound of this poor merchant's flesh, thou wilt not only lose the forfeiture, but touched with Human gentleness and love forgive a moiety of the principle. Glancing an eye of pity on his losses that have so late huddled on his back. We all expect a gentle answer, Jew. I have possessed your grace of what I purpose, and by our holy Sabbath I have sworn to have the due and forfeit of my bond. If you deny it, let the danger light upon your charter and the city's freedom. You'll ask me why I rather choose to have a weight of carrion flesh than to receive 3,000 ducats. I'll not answer that, but say it is my humor. Is it answered? As there is no firm reason to be rendered, so I can give no reason, nor I will not. More than be a lodged hate and a certain loathing, I bear Antonio, that I follow thus a losing suit against him. Are you answered? There is no answer, thou unfeeling man, to excuse the current of thy cruelty. I am not bound to please thee with my answers. Do all men kill the things they do not love? Hate any man the thing he would not kill? Every offense is not a hate at first. And what, wouldst thou have a serpent sting thee twice? I pray you, thank you question with the Jew. You may as well go stand upon the beach and bid the main flood bait his usual height. You may as well use question with the wolf why he hath made the ewe bleat for the lamb. You may as well forbid the mountain pines to wag their high tops and to make no noise when they are fretting with the guts, gusts of heaven. You may as well do anything most hard as seek to soften that than which was what's harder, his Jewish heart. Therefore I do beseech you, make no more offers. Use no farther means. But with all brief and plain conveniency, let me have judgment and the Jew his will. For thy 3,000 ducats, here is six. If every ducat in 6,000 ducats were in six parts, and every part a ducat, I would not draw them. I would have my bond. How shalt thou hope for mercy? rendering none. What judgment shall I dread doing no wrong? The pound of flesh which I demand of him is dearly bought. Tis mine, and I will have it. If you deny me, fie upon your law. There is no force in the decrees of Venice. I stand for judgment. Answer shall I have it. 
Upon my power, I may dismiss this court unless Bellario, a learned doctor, whom I have sent for to determine this, comes here today. My lord, here stays without a messenger with letters from the doctor. New come from Padua. Bring us the letter. Call the messenger. Good cheer, Antonio. What man? Courage yet. The Jew shall have my flesh, blood, bones, and all, ere thou shalt lose for me one drop of blood. I am a tainted weather of the flock. Meet is for death. The weakest kind of fruit drops earliest to the ground, and so let me. You cannot better be employed, Bassanio, than to live still and write my epitaph. Came you from Padua, from Bellario? From both, my lord. Bellario greets your grace. Why dost thou wet thy knife so earnestly? To cut the forfeiture from that bankrupt there. And no prayers pierce thee? <laughs> no, none that thou hast wit enough to make. Oh, be thou damned, inscrucible dog! And for thy life let justice be accused. Thou almost makest me waver in my faith to hold opinion with Pythagoras, that souls of animals infuse themselves into the trunks of men. Thy curish spirit governed a wolf, who hanged for human slaughter, even from the gallows did his fell soul fleet. And while thou layst in thy unhallowed dam, infuse itself in thee. For thy desires are wolfish, bloody, starved, and ravenous. Though thou canst rail the seal from off my bond, thou but offense thy lungs to speak so loud. Repair thy wit, good youth, or it will fall to cureless ruin. I stand here for law. This letter from Bellario doth commend a young and learned doctor to our court. Where is he? He attendeth here hard by to know your answer, whether you'll admit him. With all my heart. Some three or four of you go give him courteous conduct to this place. Meantime, the court shall hear Bellario's letter. Your grace shall understand that at the receipt of your letter I am very sick, but in the instant that your messenger came in loving visitation was with me a young doctor of Rome, his name is Balthazar. I acquainted him with the cause and controversy between the Jew and Antonio the merchant. We turned over many books together. He is furnished with my opinion, which, bettered with his own learning, the greatness whereof I cannot enough commend, comes with him at my importunity to fill up your grace's request in my stead. I beseech you, let this lack of years be no impediment to let him lack a reverend estimation. For I never knew so young a body with so old a head. I leave him to your gracious acceptance, whose trial shall better publish his commendation. You hear the Lord Bellario what he writes, and here I take it is the doctor come. Give me your hand. You come from old Bellario. I did, my lord. You are welcome. Take your place. Are you acquainted? with the difference that holds this present question in the court. I am informed thoroughly of the cause. Uh, which is the merchant here and which the Jew? Antonio and old Shylock both stand forth. Is your name Shylock? Shylock is my name. Of a strange nature is the suit you follow, <laughs> yet in such rule that the Venetian law cannot impugn you as you do proceed. You stand within this danger, do you not? I so he says. Do you confess the bond? I do. Then must the Jew be merciful? <laughs> On what compulsion must I? Tell me that. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. Tis mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty, wherein doth sits the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. 
It is an attribute to God himself. And earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice. Therefore, Jew, though justice be thy plea, consider this, that in the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. We do pray for mercy. And that same prayer doth teach us all to render the deeds of mercy. I have spoke thus much to mitigate the justice of thy plea, which, if thou follow, the strict court of Venice must needs give sentence against the merchants there. My deeds upon my head. I crave the law, the penalty and forfeit of my bond. Is he not able to discharge the money? Yes, here I tender it for him in the court. Yea, twice the sum. If that will not suffice, I will be bound to pay it ten times o'er. On forfeit of my hands, my head, my heart, if this will not suffice, it must appear that malice bears down truth. And I beseech you, rest once the law to your authority to do a great right, do a little wrong, and curb this cruel devil of his will. It must not be. There is no power in Venice can alter a decree established. It will be recorded for a precedent, and many an error by the same example will rush into the state. It cannot be. A Daniel come to judgment. Yea, a Daniel. A wise young judge, how I do honor thee. I pray you, let me look upon the bond. Here it is, most reverend doctor. Here it is. Shylock, there's thrice the money offered thee. An oath. An oath. I have an oath in heaven. Shall I lay perjury upon my soul? No, not for Venice. <sighs> By this bond is forfeit, and lawfully by this the Jew may claim a pound of flesh to be by him cut off nearest the merchant's heart. Be merciful, take thrice thy money, bid me tear the bond. When it is paid according to the tenor, it doth appear you are a worthy judge, you know the law, your exposition hath been most sound. I charge you by the law, whereof you are a well-deserving pillar, proceed to judgment. By my soul, I swear, there is no power in the tongue of man to alter me. I stay here on my bond. Most heartily, I do beseech the court to give the judgment. Why then, thus it is. You must prepare your bosom for his knife. Oh, noble judge. Oh, excellent young man. For the intent and purpose of the law hath full relation to the penalty, which here appeareth due upon the bond. Tis very true, O oh, wise and upright judge. How much more elder art thou than thy looks? Therefore, lay bare your bosom. I his breast. So it says in the bond, doth it not, noble judge? <laughs> Nearest his heart, those are the very words. It is so. Um... Are there balance here to weigh the flesh? I have them ready. Uh, have by some surgeon, Shylock, on your charge to stop his wounds, lest he do bleed to death. Is it so nominated in the bond? It is not so expressed, but what of that? <laughs> Twere good you do so much for charity. I cannot find it. Tis not in the bond. You, merchant, have you anything to say? But little. I am armed and well prepared. Give me your hand, Bassanio. Fare you well. Grieve not that I am fallen to this for you. For her fortune shows herself more kind than is her custom. It is still her use to let the wretched man outlive his wealth. To view with hollow eye and wrinkled brow an age of poverty from which lingering penance of such misery doth she cut me off. Then mend me to your honorable wife. Tell her the process of Antonio's end. Say how I loved you. Speak me fair in death, and when the tale is told, bid her be judged whether Bassanio had not once a love. Repent, but you that you shall lose your friend, and he repents not that he pays your debt. For if the Jew do cut but deep enough, 
I'll pay it presently with all my heart. Antonio, I am married to a wife, which is as dear to me as life itself. But life itself, my wife and all the world are not with me esteemed above thy life. I would lose all, I sacrifice them all here to this devil to deliver you. Your wife would give you little thanks for that if she were by to hear you make the offer. I have a wife whom I protest I love. I wish she were in heaven so she could entreat some power to change this curious Jew. Tis well you offer it behind her back. The wish would make else an unquiet house. These be the Christian husbands. I have a daughter. Would any of the stock of Barabbas had been her husband rather than a Christian? We trifle time. I pray thee pursue sentence. A pound of that same merchant's flesh is thine. The court awards it and the law doth give it. Most rightful judge. And you must cut this flesh from off his breast. The law allows it, and the court awards it. Most learned judge, a sentence, come, prepare. And tarry a little. There is something else. This bond here doth give thee no jot of blood. The words expressly are a pound of flesh. Take then thy bonds, take thou thy pound of flesh, but in the cutting of it, if thou dost shed one drop of Christian blood, thy lands and goods are, by the laws of Venice, confiscate unto the state of Venice. Oh, upright judge! Marked you, O oh, learned judge! Is that the law? Thyself shall see the act, for as thou urgest justice, be assured thou shalt have justice more than thou desirest. Oh, learned judge! Mark you, oh, learned judge! I take this offer then. Pay the bond price and let the Christian go. Here's the money. Soft, the Jew shall have all justice. Soft, no haste. He shall have nothing but the penalty. Oh, Jew! An upright judge, a learned judge. Therefore, prepare thee to cut off the flesh. Shed thou no blood, nor cut thou less, no more, but just a pound of flesh. Thou cuts more or less than a just pound, be it but so much as makes it light or heavy in the substance, or the division of the twentieth part of one poor scruple. Nay, if the scale do turn, but in the estimation of a hair, Thou diest, and all thy goods are confiscate. A second Daniel? A Daniel Jew? Now, infidel, I have you on the hip. Why doth the Jew pause? Take thy forfeiture. Give me my principal, and let me go. I have it ready for thee. Here it is. He hath refused it in the open court. He shall have merely justice and his bond. A Daniel still say I, a second Daniel. I thank thee, Jew, for teaching me that word. Shall I not have barely my principal? Thou shalt have nothing but the forfeiture to be so taken at thy peril, Jew. Why, then the devil give him good of it. I'll say no longer question. The tarry, Jew, the law hath yet another hold on you. It is enacted in the laws of Venice, uh, if it be proved against an alien, that by direct or indirect attempts he seek the life of any citizen, the party against the which he doth contrive shall seize one half of his goods. The other half comes to the privy coffer of the state, and the offender's life lies in the mercy of the duke only, against all other voice. In which predicament, I say, thou Stanced. For it appears by manifest proceeding that indirectly and directly too thou hast contrived against the very life of the defendant, and thou hast incurred the danger formerly by me rehearsed. Down, therefore, and beg mercy of the Duke. Beg that thou may mayst have leave to hang thyself, and yet thy wealth being forfeit to the state. Thou hast not left the value of a cord. 
Therefore, thou must be hanged at the state's charge. That thou shalt see the difference of our spirits. I pardon thee thy life before thou ask it. For half thy wealth, it is Antonio's. The other half comes to the general state, which humbleness may drive into a fine. I for the state, not for Antonio. Hey, take my life and all. Pardon not that. You take my house when you do take the prop that doth sustain my house. You take my life when you do take the means whereby I live. What mercy can you render him, Antonio? A halter gratis, nothing else for God's sakes. So please my lord the duke and all the court to quit the fine for one half of his goods, I am content. So he will let me have the other half in use to render it upon his death unto the gentleman that, stole, that lately stole his daughter. Two things provided more than more that for this favor. He presently become a Christian. The other that he do record a gift. Here in the court of all he dies possessed unto his son Lorenzo and his daughter. He shall do this or else I do recant the pardon that I late pronounce it here. Thou contented Jew, what dost thou say? I am content. Clerk, draw a deed of gift. I pray you give me leave to go from hence. I am not well. Send the deed after me and I will sign it. Get thee gone, but do it. In christening shalt thou have two godfathers? Had I been judge? Thou shouldst have had ten more to bring thee to the gallows, not the font. Sir, I entreat you home with me to dinner. I humbly do desire your grace of pardon. I must away this night toward Padua, and it is meet I presently set forth. I am sorry that your leisure serves you not. Antonio, gratify this gentleman, for, in my mind, you are much bound to him. Most worthy gentlemen, I and my friend have by your wisdom been this day acquitted of grievous penalties. In lieu whereof three thousand ducats do unto the Jew, we freely cope your courteous pains with all. And stand indebted over and above in love and service to you evermore. He is well paid that is well satisfied. And I, delivering you, am satisfied, and therein do account myself well paid. My mind was never yet more mercenary. I pray you, know me when we meet again. I wish you well, and so I take my leave. Dear sir, of force I must attempt you further. Take some remembrance of us as a tribute, not as a fee. Grant me two things, I pray you, not to deny me and to pardon me. You press me far, and therefore I will yield. Give me your gloves, I'll wear them for your sake. Uh, and for your love, I'll take this ring from you. Not draw back your hand. I'll take no more, and you in love shall not deny me this. This ring, good sir, alas, it, it is a trifle. I will not shame myself to give you this. I will have nothing else but only this, and now methinks I have a mind to it. There's more depends on this than on the value of the dearest ring in Venice will I give you and, and find it out by proclamation. Only for this, I pray you pardon me. I see, sir, you are liberal in offers you taught me first to beg. And now methinks you teach me how a beggar should be answered. Good sir, this ring was given to me by my wife. And when she, puts, and when she put it on, she made me vow that I should neither sell nor give nor lose it. That skew serves many men to save their gifts. And if your wife be not a mad woman, and know how well I have deserved the ring, she would not hold out enemy forever for giving it to me. Well, peace be with you. My lord Bassanio, let him have the ring, that his deservings and my love with all be valued against your wife's commandment. Go, Gratiano. Run and overtake him, give him the ring, and bring him, if thou canst, unto Antonio's house. Away! Make haste! Come, you and I will thither presently, and in the morning early we 
We will both fly toward Belmont. Come, Antonio. Scene two, the same. A street. Enter Portia and Nerissa. Inquire the Jew's house out. Give him this deed and let him sign it. We'll away tonight and be a day before our husband's home. This deed will be well welcome to Lorenzo. Fair sir, you are well overtain. My Lord Bassanio, upon more advice, has sent you here this ring and doth entreat your company at dinner. <laughs> that cannot be. Uh, his ring I do accept most thankfully, and so I pray you tell him. That will I do. Uh, sir, I would speak with you. I'll see if I can get my husband's ring, which I did make him swear to keep forever. Thou mayst, I warrant. We shall have old swearing that they did give the rings away to men, but we'll outface them and outswear them too. Away, make haste. Thou knowest where I will tarry. Come, good sir. Will you show me to this house? Act five, scene one, Belmont. Avenue to Portia's house. Enter Lorenzo and Jessica. Hmm. The moon shines bright in such a night as this, when the sweet wind did gently kiss the trees, and they did make no noise. Hmm. Such a night, methinks Troilus mounted the Trojan walls and sighed his soul toward the Grecian tents where Cressida lay that night. In such a night did Thisbe fearfully or trip the dew and saw the lion's shadow where himself and ran dismayed away. Well, in such a night stood Dido with a willow in her hand upon the wild sea banks and waft her love to come again from Carthage. In such a night, Medea gathered the enchanted herbs that did renew old Aeson. In such a night did Jessica steal from the wealthy Jew and with an unthrift love did run from Venice as far as Belmont. In such a night did Lorenzo swear he loved her well, stealing her soul with many vows of fate and ne'er a true one. In such a night did pretty Jessica, like a shrew, slander her love. And he forgave it her. <laughs> I would outnight you, did nobody come. Oh, but hark, I hear the footing of a man. Who comes so fast in the silent of night? I bring word. My mistress will before the break of day be here at Belmont. I pray you, is my master yet returned? He is not, nor we have not heard from him. But go we in, I, I pray thee, Jessica, and ceremoniously let us prepare some welcome for the mistress of the house. Salah, salah, oh, salah, salah. Who calls? Tell him there's a post come from my master with his horn full of good news. My master will be here ere morning. Balthazar, signify? I pray you, within the house, your mistress is at hand, and bring your music forth into the air. Hmm. How sweet the moonlight sleeps upon this bank. Here we will sit and let the sounds of music creep in our ears. Soft stillness and the night become the touches of sweet harmony. Sit, Jessica. Look how the floor of heaven is thick, inlaid with patines of bright gold. There is not the smallest orb which thou beholdest, but in his motion like an angel sings, still choiring to the young-eyed cherubims. Such harmony is in immortal souls. But whilst this muddy vestiture of decay doth grossly close it in, we cannot hear it. Hmm. 
I am never merry when I hear sweet music. Well, the reason is your spirits are attentive. For do but note a wild and wanton herd, or race of youthful and unhandled colts, fetching mad bounds, bellowing and neighing loud, which is the hot condition of their blood. If they but hear perchance a trumpet sound, or any air of music touch their ears, you shall perceive them make a mutual stand there. Savage eyes turn to a modest glaze by the sweet power of music. Therefore, the poet did feign that Orpheus drew trees, stones, and floods, since not so stockish, hard, and full of rage, but for music for the time doth change his nature. The man hath no music in himself, nor is not moved with the concord of sweet sounds, is fit for treasons, stratagems, and spoils. The motions of his spirit are dull as night, and his affections dark as Erebus. Let no such man be trusted. Mark the music. <laughs> That light we see is burning in my hall. How far that little candle throws his beams. So shines a good deed in a naughty world. When the moon shone, we did not see the candle. So doth the greater glory dim the less. A substitute shines brightly as a king unto the king be by, and then his state empties itself as doth an inland brook into the main of waters. Music, hark. It is your music, madam, of the house. Nothing is good, I see, without respect. Methinks it sounds much sweeter than by day. Silence bestows that virtue on it, madam. That is the voice, or I am much deceived, of Portia. He knows me as the blind man knows the cuckoo by the bad voice. Dear lady, welcome home. We have been praying for our husband's health, which speed, we hope, the better for our words. Are they returned? Madam, they are not yet, but there is come a messenger before to signify their coming. Uh, go in, Nerissa. Uh, give order to my servants that they take no note at all of our being absent hence. Nor you, Lorenzo, Jessica, nor you. A tuck it sounds. Your husband is at hand. I hear his trumpet. We are no telltales, madam, fear you not. This night, methinks, is but the daylight sick looks a little paler. Tis a day such as the day is when the sun is hid. We should hold day, we should hold day with the Antipodes if you would walk in absence of the sun. But God soar all, you are welcome home, my lord. I thank you, madam. Give welcome to my friend. This is the man, this is Antonio, to whom I am so infinitely bound. You should in all sense be much bound to him, for as I hear, he was much bound for you. No more than I am well acquainted of, acquitted of. Uh, sir, you are very welcome to our house. Uh, it must appear in other ways than words, therefore I scant this breathing courtesy. By yonder moon, I swear you do me wrong. In faith, I gave it to the judge's clerk. Would he were guilt that had it, for my part, since you do take it, love, so much at heart. A quarrel? Huh? Already? What's the matter? About a hoop of gold, a paltry ring, that she did give me, whose posy was, for all the world, like culture's poetry, upon a knife, love me and leave me not. What talk of you of the posy or the value? You swore to me when I did give it you that you would wear it till your hour of death and that it should lie with you in your grave. Though not for me, yet for your vehement oaths, you should have been respected and have kept it. Now by this hand, I gave it to a youth. <laughs> Kind of boy, a little scrubbed boy, who oh, higher than thyself, the judge's clerk, a prating boy that begged it as a fee. 
I could not for my heart deny it him. You were to blame. I must be plain with you. Depart so slightly with your wife's first gift? A thing stuck on with oaths upon your finger and so riveted with faith unto your flesh. I gave my love a ring and made him swear never to part with it. And here he stands. I dare be sworn for him he would not leave it nor pluck it from his finger for the wealth that the world masters. Now in faith, Gratiano, you give your wife too unkind a cause of grief. And twere to me, I should be mad about it. Why, I were best to cut my left hand off and swear I lost the ring defending it. My lord Bassanio gave his ring away unto the judge that begged it and indeed deserved it too. And then the boy, his clerk, that took some pains in writing, he begged mine. And neither man nor master would take aught but the two rings. What ring gave you, my lord? Not that, I hope, which you received of me. If I could add a lie unto a fault, I would deny it. But you see, my finger hath not the ring upon it. It is gone. Even so void is your false heart of truth. By heaven, I will ne'er come in your bed until I see the ring. Nor I in yours till I, I again see mine. Sweet Portia, if you did know to whom I gave the ring, if you did know for whom I gave the ring, and who would conceive for what I gave the ring, and how unwillingly I left the ring, when naught would be accepted but the ring, you would abate the strength of your displeasure. If you had known the virtue of the ring, or half her worthiness that gave the ring, or your own honor to contain the ring, you would not then have parted with the ring. Nerissa teaches me what to believe. I'll die for it, but some woman had the ring. No, by my honor, madam, by my soul, no woman had it but a civil doctor, which did refuse 3,000 ducats of me and begged the ring the which I did deny him and suffered him to go displeased away. Even he that did uphold the very life of my dear friend. What should I say, sweet lady? I was enforced to send it after him. I was beset with shame and courtesy. My honor would not let ingratitude so much besmear it. Pardon me, good lady, for by these blessed candles of the night, had you been there, I think you would have begged the ring for me, the begged the ring of me to give the worthy doctor. I am the unhappy subject of these quarrels. Uh, sir, grieve not you. You are welcome, notwithstanding. Portia, forgive me this enforced wrong. And in the hearing of these many friends, I swear to thee, even by thine own fair eyes, wherein I see myself. But mark you but that. In both my eyes he doubly sees himself, and each eye one. Swear by your double self, and there's an oath of credit. Nay, but hear me. Pardon this fault, and by my soul I swear I never more will break an oath with thee. I once did lend my body for his wealth, which but for him that had your husband's ring had quite miscarried. I dare be bound again, my soul upon the forfeit, that your Lord will never more break faith advisedly. Then you shall be his surety. Give him this, and bid him keep it better than the other. Here, Lord Bassanio, swear to keep this ring. By heaven, it is the same I gave the doctor. I had it of him. Uh, pardon me, Bassanio, for by this ring the doctor lay with me. And pardon me, my gentle Graziano, for that same scrubbed boy, the doctor's clerk, in lieu of this last night, did lie with me. What? Are we cuckold ere we have deserved it? Speak not so grossly. You are all amazed. Here is a letter. Read it at your leisure. It comes from Padua, from Bellario. There you shall find that Portia was the doctor, Nerissa there her clerk. Lorenzo here shall witness I set forth as soon as you and even but now returned. I have not yet entered my house. Antonio, you are welcome. 
And I have better news in store for you than you expect. Unseal this letter soon. There you shall find three of your argosies are richly come to harbor suddenly. You shall not know by what strange accident I chanced on this letter. I am dumb. <laughs> Were you the doctor and I knew you not? You the clerk that is to make me cuckold? Aye, but the clerk that never means to do it unless he live until he be a man. Sweet doctor, you shall be my bedfellow. When I am absent, then lie with my wife. Sweet lady, you have given me life and living. For here I read for certain that my ships are safely come to road. How now, Lorenzo? My clerk has some good comforts, too, for you. Aye, and I'll give them to him without a fee. There do I give to you and Jessica from the rich Jew a special deed of gift. After his death, of all he dies possessed of. Fair ladies, you drop manna in the way of starved people. It is almost morning, and yet I am sure you are not satisfied of these events at full. Let us go in, and charge us there upon interrogatories, and we will answer all things faithfully. Let it be so. The first interrogatory that my Naressa shall be sworn on is whether till the next night she had rather stay or go to bed now, being two hours today. But were the day come, I should wish it dark, that I were couching with doctor's clerks. Well, while I live, I'll fear no other thing. So sore is keeping safe Nerissa's ring. <laughs>